like as we are, yet without sin. Do we believe that? Okay, so Luke 2.40 says, The child grew and waxed strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Waxed strong is a fancy way of saying that he was empowered and strengthened in the spirit. So if Jesus is modeling for us, which he was, how to grow up in God, how to grow up and be righteous, how to grow up and be strong, he had to grow and walk strong in the spirit. He had to be empowered and strengthened by spending time with his father and growing in the spirit so that he would be able to give in to the spirit at all times. He had to yield all the time. He had to continually choose it. So he walked out his life reflecting the spirit of the Godhead to the whole world. For 33 years, he lived in a family. He was a, he was a part of a family. He was a carpenter. He had real wood, and I don't know what they used back then. I'm sure they had some kind of nails. They did something. But he had to learn how to do all of those things. He wasn't born with, you know, well, he... Do you guys get that he chose to leave glory and all of that so that he could come and live as a man so that we could win? I mean, he had to lay aside all of the things that we think are, you know, like it's still a part of him. Well, here's the part of him that, that always was. And always will be his spirit. And he came and lived inside of a human body just like we have. Where he could feel pain. Do you think he was painless on the cross? No. Do you think he ever had emotions that hurt his feelings? I mean... I think we make him so supernatural that we don't relate to him anymore. And then on top of that, forget the father. We just think he's some bad guy sitting on a chair that's mad at us and ready to call down fire from heaven to destroy us when in actuality he is just nothing but altogether presence and light and life and inviting. And so he waited from the foundations of the world until the timing was perfect. And then he came to unite you back to the Father and he came in this body that had to learn. But, but here is the good part. He modeled for us how to do it perfectly. He was perfect, not because it was easy, but because he lived according to the Spirit and he showed us how. So, Romans 8, 11, here's good news for you. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, will also, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. He, he's not trying to beat himself into you. He made you with himself in you. He's just trying to get you to acknowledge him. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay. So now, if... I promise you I'd show you how to overcome the temptation of the enemy this week, so I'm going to do that. Um, but you're not going to win against the enemy by natural instincts. We keep trying, and that's why we keep failing. We, we are operating according to the way that we would win with somebody else in a boxing match. You know, we, we don't have to box with the enemy. He's defeated. Our problem is we haven't renewed our mind to the fact of who we really are and that he's defeated. 
he doesn't really have any more power over us except for the power that we entitle him with. So, Jesus is modeling to us how we're supposed to live, and it really doesn't go so much into his whole life up until he's 33. We know that he, he spent time in the temple. We know that he was led by the Spirit to go in, and you know his parents lost him for a couple days because he was busy about his father's business. If we are his children, then we need to be busy about our father's business. Now, what is our father's business? Being victorious, overcoming, leading, uh, um, showing other people how the word can come alive. I mean, what was Jesus doing there? He was, he was learning and he was living and he was breathing in the truth of what God was saying. He went in the temple. Do you, he would listen to the words of the prophets and it would go into his spirit and make his spirit come alive. He had to grow and wax strong in the spirit. Remember that. Okay, so now he's, he's 33 and it's time. It's time for him to be released. And now he's released and the Spirit is leading him. Yay, the Spirit's leading him. Woo, it's going to be awesome. And then you go to Mark 1.12 and it says, And immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Oh, yay. <laughs> he's driven by the Spirit, but where? The wilderness. He goes straight into the wilderness. That, that word doesn't just mean a desert place. It means lonesome. I know. That's what I did too. Jesus went into this lonely place. He went into a place and the Spirit drove him there. Why? Why? Because he was never going to, to learn how or to be what he needed to be if he tried to do it in any part of the natural. He had to get isolated. He had to feel what we would feel. He had to know how that the Spirit would lead him and make him thrive in the midst of nothing and in the midst of an attack of the enemy. Now, let's be honest, we're, we're pretty good as long as our life is good. If everything is going right, we're good. We love Jesus. You know, we're all smiles and ice cream and Jesus is good. You know, when you first get saved, everything is wonderful. You pray a prayer, boom, it's answered. And then, you know, then Jesus goes, you need to wax strong in the spirit. So let's see if you... If you're going to wax strong in the face of adversity. And so we have to learn and we have to grow and we have to be strengthened by the Spirit and not by natural means. Because, you know, we can strong arm some stuff up. And we can even look really spiritual to other people. We can be living a dual life. Do you ever wonder why, you know, I, I hate it when this happens, but... You know, pastors kill themselves, commit suicide. People go, how could he commit suicide? How could she commit suicide? Because they're living a dual life. Because they can be one way in front of people, and they can be another way behind the doors, and they don't know how to reconcile it. So when they give up, they give up. But we're not supposed to live that way. And the problem is nobody's taught people how to rise above the difficulties of life. We're not, we're not living the word the way that we are supposed to live the word. Because if we did, we would live in victory and we would face these obstacles without a bunch of nonsense in our life. We wouldn't accuse God when things go wrong because he's not to be accused. Our Father is a good God. My Bible tells me that Jesus came to give me life and life abundantly. 
We know who comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. And it isn't God. So get yourself straight. How do you do? Fix your mind on the truth of the word. Okay, so the Spirit drove him here because he was going to have to walk according to, to the Spirit and not by the flesh. Jesus. Jesus himself was going to have to walk according to the Spirit. Okay, so the good news is, is that right now God is not positioning, but I believe repositioning his church to have a deeper understanding of who we are, a revelation by our spirit man that is going to awaken us, like he said this morning, to a higher truth, that, that we're going to break out with obvious truth and awakening that will cause desire for other people to want to know him like we do. If, if your God is alive on some days and dead on others, who wants him? Do you want a sometime dad? Or you want an all the time dad? Do you want a partial dad? Or you want a full dad? Well, see, we pretend or act up and we go like, you know, God, where were you when blah, blah, blah? And he's like, oh my goodness, where were you? Because you weren't on my lap, because if you were, you would understand. Now, we live in this world, and in this world, we will have tribulations. Hello. It says it in the Word of God. Are we going to take the whole Word of God or the parts we like? Tribulation? Oh, yay, it's yours. But be of good cheer. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And he's about to show us how. So we need to pay attention. He's invested this in the word of God. Inspired words that came out of the spirit of God. Written on pages spilled by blood so that we could live differently. It's pretty important. So, he's promised us a, an outpour of his spirit, but we have to decide how much we're going to walk with him. See, every individual in this room has meters. Like, I'm going to walk with you 20%, because you ain't touching this 80% of my life. I got, I'm good over there, leave me alone. You know, I'm 40% going to walk with you. 50% going to walk with you. Maybe some 80% I'm going to walk with you. Well, whatever percentage that we surrender to his ways is how much you're going to walk in victory. Well, I'm not victorious. Check your meter. Maybe you need to put some more time in. Okay. Here's what God's looking for. Weak people who find their strength in him. Ha. You know, we think we got to be strong and then he's going to like us better. Oh, for heaven's sake. He loves you so much, he just can't even stand it. He is so in love with you, you can't make him be more in love with you. But he's looking for you in your weakness to become strong by spending time with him and learning how to walk according to his presence. And so, how many of you are weak enough to say, I need more of Jesus? <laughs> exactly. All right. So, according to the word, we have temptations from the enemy and they're breaking down easy for us. Three categories. Oh, yay. <laughs> First John 2.16 breaks it down for us. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Really? 
Mm-hmm. So it's very obvious that God is not the one who's tempting you. However, it's also very obvious you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted in these ways. So lust, the word lust here means um, to appeal to. The, it means that the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's going to appeal to you or it wouldn't be a temptation. You understand? If there, was, if there was no kind of temptation in sin, everybody would just walk sinless. And so if you say you're sinless to me today, it's only because you understand that the blood has covered your sin. Otherwise, you you know, need help and deliverance. Okay. So we're going to break down the three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So how was Jesus tempted in these ways, and, and how did he overcome? Okay. I'm going to give you the scripture for what I said earlier. It's Hebrews 4.15, but I'm reading it to you out of the Amplified. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. That's who Jesus really is. He, he wasn't floating on a cloud while he was here on our earth. He was a man on purpose, tempted in every way. Okay, so God had a purpose, design, and structure. And he's about ready to reveal it through this interaction that Jesus is about ready to have with Satan. And he's going to prove to us how we are redeemed from it. So... Matthew 4.1 says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he went into the wilderness for a purpose, to be tempted. By who? By the devil. Okay. And he led him into this. So what is Jesus' response to when he's going in to this place and he's tempted The next verse tells us, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Jesus' first response to going into a place where he was lonely, his first response to going into a place where he was going to be tempted by his adversary was, I am going to get my spirit built up and I'm going to deny my flesh. You know, he could have taken bread with him. He could have taken... Listen, ravens could have come and gave him anything he wanted. All he had to do was ask. But instead, he on purpose denied his flesh and decided, I am going to deny my flesh so that my spirit is so strong that I am going to win this battle. But we can't go 21 days in January with the fast without cheating. And then we got to pick certain things that we're going to, and then we change it every week. Well, this week I'll fast ice cream, but next week I'm going to eat my ice cream and I'm going to fast chicken because I don't like it anyway. (laughs) You know. And so we don't even know how to deny ourselves anymore. We're just like, okay, well... We're going we're gonna to be easy on ourselves. God understands me, you know. Yes, he does, which is why he wants you to deny your flesh and to feed your spirit. Amen? Okay, so the next verse. When the tempter came to him, this is what he says. If you are, if you are the son of God, first of all, he needs to be slapped, command that these stones become bread. So what is this? This is the lust of the flesh. Because Jesus is what? Hungry. He's hungry. And so he goes, oh, you think you're going to... Satan really thinks he's going to win. I, I really think at the end of the book, you know, when it says that we win and Jesus won, I think he still thinks he can change that. I mean, the deceiver is deceived. Uh, That's my own opinion because I can't prove that. It doesn't say that. I'm just saying. He's so stupid. They could probably believe that he could still win. 
because he thinks he's going to win here against Jesus. Ridiculous. Why? Because he fed his spirit. Okay, so he was hungry. The lust of the flesh isn't just natural bread. So you say, what does that have to do with me? I'm just, you're going to be hungry. It's on, you know, 20 till noon. You guys, alarms go off inside your stomachs. Okay? <laughs> yes, and sometimes earlier. It includes anything that appeals to your fallen nature. The lust of the flesh is anything that appeals to man's fallen nature. Got that? So a Christian can possess the old flesh and the new nature of the spirit in him at the same time. That's why you're tempted. All right? If you weren't tempted, then you wouldn't be human, okay? So God's given mankind desires. And like you have a desire for hunger. It's not wrong to want some food. You need food in your body. Okay? But how many of you know that hunger can become gluttony? Let's be real. We don't want to talk about that one. Okay? It's still true, though. Okay? So he created us to have a thirst. But we can thirst for the wrong stuff. Oh, yeah. We can, we can have a thirst for things that are unsavory to God. He, he, gave us a, he gave us a desire to be strong, but we can be strong in the wrong things, and we can be weak in the wrong things. You understand? And so when we get weary, we can get lazy. We get lazy because we don't want to work for the kingdom. We say we want to work for the kingdom. I want to work for the kingdom. And then God goes, okay. And then, you, and then you start working for the kingdom and you go, I give you so much, God. <laughs> and God goes, didn't you ask me to use you? But I feel so used. Didn't you ask me to use you? Yeah, I didn't know what the word meant. Look it up in the dictionary. It means you're going to be busy about your father's business. You're not supposed to pick laziness as a quality so that people could see what God is like on the earth. What does God look like on the earth? Well, he's in a reclining chair watching TV for seven hours a day. That, okay. The good news is, <laughs> Jesus was spirit-led and when he was tempted by the lust of the flesh, the spirit of God that he had just fed enabled him to respond this way. He answered and said, yeah, I might be hungry, but it's written, man is not going to live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, Satan, I just spent 40 days going over with God all the stuff he's already said. So do you really think I'm going to eat bread that you provide? I've eaten so much better. I've eaten the bread that comes from my heavenly Father. It is so satisfying that that is not a temptation to me. I don't need bread. I don't need a chicken leg. I just need more God. Oh, yeah. And so you're not going to thrive by natural remedies alone because you're spirit. You know, we keep having these less of what we're going to do and not do, you know, and then you're just going to wear yourself out. We're, we're not going back under the law, people. I'm not, I'm not telling you that you can't live a life. You're even supposed to have some fun, which was a hard thing for me to understand. But, but you're supposed to enjoy your life. God is not against you having fun. It's just the way that you have fun. Can you honor him when you're having fun? You can. I mean, Jesus was pretty cool. You know, he laughed. He had a good time with his disease. You don't think he was this boring, skinny, ridiculous-looking, you know, undernourished person, do you? He was fun. Where do you think we get our sense of humor? 
You know, he, he was great to be around. People wanted to hang out with him. He was probably the most, he, well, he was. You know, there's four personality traits, and if you know them, you know them. And if you don't, I'm not going to try to teach you them today. But everybody has at least one strong part of your personality, and some of you have many. But there's four strong personalities, and Jesus had it all. And one of those is the life of the party. Ha! Yeah, man. And so we're made in his image and in his likeness. We're supposed to be the life of the party. Just a righteous one. People are supposed to be drawn to you. They should want to be around you because you're, you're fun and happy and, and like inclusive instead of reclusive and weird and blah. You know? Tacky. Okay, so God, this being the point, God already saw this moment of temptation and he had already given and equipped Jesus to win it. Just like he's already equipped you to win it too. But Jesus had to choose and you will have to choose. Right? Okay, so... He equipped him for the win. His answer was, you know, I'm going to live by the word. I'm not going to live by bread, loser. So Satan goes, hmm, all right, next temptation. So, verse 5, then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if, if, which... If you are the son of God, he's always saying, are you really, are you really, are you really, are you really? Are you really who God said you are? Are you really going to, you know, he lived in a human body. So he's trying to get him to doubt his own identity as the son of God and the son of man. He was tempted in every way like as you are yet without sin. Do you forget who you are in God sometimes? Satan is trying to get Jesus to give up on his identity of who he really is as a son of God as well as a son of man, just like he's always after you. And so he says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So which temptation is this? Lust of the flesh? No. Nope. Pride of life. Okay, so why? Look at what's in the middle of pride. I. I is in the middle of pride. It's living like everything else is going to revolve around you. And so when we try to be God and take God's role in our lives, we're following in the footsteps of the father of lies. When <sighs> this is a temptation... That Satan is trying to get Jesus to access something that he already had. It's true. Did he have the protection of God? All right. So what's he trying to get him to do? He's trying to make it a contest so that Jesus will fall into the temptation of proving something to the enemy. Instead of staying in who he is and just being confident, he doesn't have to prove anything to you. Why do you have to prove something to the enemy? Why do we have to prove something to anyone else? Why do we have to prove that we're more spiritual than somebody else? Why? Why do you want to be the one they look to? Because it's all about you, that's why. Instead of it being all about him. And so that is the pride of life. You want people to know how spiritual you are? You know, this is my version. The pride of life is that we rely on proving that God is with us rather than knowing and honoring the fact that God is with us. And you can quote me on that. Relying and proving that God is with it. Why do I have to prove that God is with me to somebody? No, I rely on it. I can't do nothing without him. I, I, I know that I am totally undone without him. 
I don't have the... I, I am in amazement of God on a continual basis that he even included me in his plan. Why would he do this? I would not have picked me. I still wouldn't pick me. And I have at times waxed, waxed strong in the spirit. And then at other times I've been an idiot. I'm always amazed at God not caring. He loves me because I keep going back to him going, oh, God, I'm so sorry. You know what? Okay, I count on your word, and it says if I confess this sin, you are faithful and just to forgive me of this sin, and you're going to cleanse me from this unrighteousness, and I'm not going to wallow around in this. I'm going to move forward, Satan. And it's not to prove anything to anyone else. It's to live my life in such a way that it draws people to God. So that they see more of him and less of me. Because I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I'm just me. But he is everything. He is the amazing thing that I have access to. He's the one that I love. If we don't keep honor in our hearts towards God, then we can take the grace message and we can pervert it. Now, okay. I'm sorry this is going to take a minute because I am on a rampage. There are two definitions of grace in the word of God. One is undeserved favor. True. And the other one is the empowering presence of God to do what he wants us to do and be what he's, he wants us to be. That's really the truth. It's, it's his presence upon our heart, his influence upon our heart to be able to live like him. Okay, so here is what, ha what happens. And it's not new, it's, it's old, actually. So if you want to see how it was written in the Word of God, and I won't teach that because it's a whole other teaching today, read Jude. If you just read Jude, it's one chapter. Jude will explain that there are people that came in, and he said, you've got to hold fast to the truth of the faith that we have already presented to you because there are people that are coming in, and they're trying to pervert this message of grace and make excuses for their sin. Now, there is a grace, but, and you know me, God is love. He is love. He is love. He's going to operate by love. There's nothing that you can do to stop him from loving you. But on the other side of that is this. You have a responsibility before God to walk righteously. To grow in sanctification. To not give in to this pride of life or the lust of the flesh. And so if you sin and you cry, grace, grace, he knows what I'm like. He loves me anyway. Yes, he loves you anyway. That's why he empowered you to win over sin. That's why he gave you the spirit on the inside of you so that you wouldn't be subject to this temptation so that you could live your life differently. I mean, uh, all right, I'll try to have something that's not so graphic for you, but if you are a liar and you would rather lie than tell the truth, and if you make excuse for your lies, and you just go, well, it's okay. I just told a partial lie. Is there a partial lie? No. Oh, really? No. Because if it's not the honest truth, it's not truth at all. If you're, just, if you're living your life as partially as you can, serving God, you're going to have partial victory. If you want to win in life and make a difference to those people that are around you and influence them towards God, you're going to have to choose that you're going to live your life in a different way. And that means you can't jump in and out of bed with every other person. And there I said it. 
I was trying to be palatable. It just didn't work that way. But he knows me and he loves me. Yes, stop that. There's repercussions of that. Worse than having a baby. I mean, babies we love no matter what happens, you know, since they were already there before the foundation of the world. But that's not the problem. You can get AIDS and everything else. We've got to be honest before God. Who are we living for, us or him? <sighs> okay, that, nowhere in the notes. <laughs> Grace can be a perverted message if you use it for an excuse for an occasion of the flesh. So don't be taking the word of God and twisting it around and saying you're okay because he loves you. He loves you. Now stop that. And act like a person that is loved. Act like a person that is so loved that nothing else matters except for pleasing him. Okay. You are his. The temptation of the pride of life is... What he warned you about is like sinning on purpose and then pulling out the guard, God card that he's with you anyway. Jesus saw the trap. Why? Because he was led by the Spirit. He knew that even if God would protect him, and he would, he wasn't going to play games with grace. Because it was the empowering presence of God, the divine influence on his heart, not undeserved favor. Did Jesus need undeserved favor here? No. It was the empowering presence of God and the influence on his heart that enabled him to say and do what he needed to say and to do to overcome this temptation. Okay, so if God is with us and we know it, we don't have to take the bait to try to prove that God is with us. God is with me. I don't have to prove that to Satan. I just have to be secure in it before him. Like, he's with me. Obviously, I'm still alive. Are you still breathing? Okay. If we are aware that God is with us, then we won't end up in wrong motives that lead to us taking the pride of what is accomplished. You know, um... Some people, the way that this works is this, is that they think they're so spiritual, they actually begin to believe their own you know, report that other people have said about them. And they think that they're not going to fall ever into temptation. So they, they start believing that about themselves. Like, what? In this world... You will have tribulation. You're also going to have temptations. You can't ever think, listen, anybody in a given situation at the wrong time or the right time in the right moment can make a wrong decision against God. Don't ever think that you're above that. That's why you have to stay connected. Because that's how people fall. They live this this righteous life, and then all of a sudden they do something that's so bizarre, and then they give up on themselves, and they give up on God, and they, they just are destroyed by the fact that they could fall. Here, alarm, bulletin, you can fall. You don't have to, though. You don't have to. You can choose not to, but you can. So as long as you know that, then you can keep yourself straight in the Spirit. It's not about proving something to someone else. It's not about proving anything even to yourself. It's just staying so fixed on God that you're not willing to do anything that's going to hurt his heart. And so the, Jesus is like, well, it is written, hey, don't tempt the Lord your God. Like he didn't say, of course, I'm, he'll send angels to grab me. Want to see it? He didn't do that because he could have. He could have done it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be hurt. But he didn't feel the need to do that because he wasn't going to tempt God. Basically, he said, I'm not playing games with you, Satan. You know, I'm not going to engage God with proving something foolish to you. Why do we have to prove anything to him? 
I'm going to engage, and I am secure because I have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen? All right, next verse, next temptation. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Huh. Okay, so think about this. Is Jesus a king? Is he a ruler? Is his desire to have all the nations surrender to him? So was it a temptation? Yeah. Tempted in all things like as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so this is the lust of the eyes. Okay, so this is Satan saying, next verse, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Whoa. Okay, now, the truth is, is that though Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world, we know that he was slain in the spirit, right? In the natural, he needs to walk this out. Has he gone to the cross yet at this point? No. Okay, so he wants to rule. He's a ruler. He wants to be a king. He's the king. He wants to see the nations bow down. This is why it's temptation. He's tempted to say yes. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's the truth. I'm telling you, it's the truth. And Satan had some positional authority at that time because Jesus has not taken it back from him. He's not yet been into death, hell, and the grave and grabbed those keys. He hasn't paid the price yet. And so Satan was in charge at this point because of fallen man. And so he was offering him something that he could deliver on. And it was a temptation for Jesus because, of course, he wants to be who he is, a king and a ruler. He wants nations to fall down at his feet. And so he saw it. it, took it he took them up. He took him up on this high mountain and showed him. It, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And their glory. And he goes, I'm going to give you this. And so Jesus had temptation with the lust of the eyes. He looked down and he went, that's what you should do too. <laughs> Satan was the ruler of the age at that time, and so he had some dominion. He had some authority. But here's the good news. He's been defeated now. Jesus has been to the cross. He's been to the grave, and he has arisen, and he's given you all kinds of power over the power of the enemy. He said, I've given you all power over the power of the enemy. The enemy might have some power, whatever power you let him have in your life, but God, through Jesus Christ, has delivered to you all power over the power of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Jesus did it for us. All right, so Jesus won. And this is what he said. <laughs> because of the spirit that was with him, and this is how he was able to resist the temptation. Away with you, Satan, <laughs> for it is written, for it is written, for the word of God means more to me than what you're saying, because it is written, the word of God is alive inside of me. I just spent 40 days with my father. I just spent time getting built up on the inside, and so I got news for you, Satan, you've got to get out of here, because I you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Jesus said, I choose, and here's what I choose. I choose the timing of God. He knew he was a king. He knew he was a ruler. He knew what was supposed to happen with the glory of the, of the kingdoms. He knew, but he said, you're not pushing me out of the time frame. You won't get me to take this bait. I will wait on the Lord and I will serve my Father. You're not winning here. And so he won as a man living by the Spirit, telling Satan he wasn't going to put up with him. He won. Look at somebody say he won. 
Is Jesus the king? Is he the Lord? Is he going to rule over all the nations? Hallelujah. Ha, ha, Satan. So what did Satan do? Oh, verse 11. Then the devil left him. Ha, 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 ha. Because he doesn't have any choice now. He done had his three bullets in his revolver, and he lost. And so the devil left him. He was defeated, and Jesus was led, driven by the Spirit of God, and he won. So then you got to ask yourself, if we're made in God's image and in his likeness, and we have the Spirit of God in us when we're born again, then can you walk according to the Spirit and win? You can. Isn't that amazing? All right. So when you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you will begin to operate out of different wisdom. You'll operate out of the wisdom that God gives you. Okay. So look at somebody and say, you are in this world, but you're not of this world. That's right. We just have to get this so solid on the inside of us that we're not going to be taken out, okay? We are here, we are here, but we are not of this world. We are spirit beings. We don't have to live just with the physical realm, we can have something higher inside of us because we're built to impact others' lives and bring forth God's purpose on the earth. I mean, you're built for something more. You are built for greatness. You are built to overcome. You are built for victory. You are built to show other people what God is like and model it out for him. You're built to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You, you are, you're built to raise people from the dead. That's what you're built for. Not whining and crying and begging God for stuff. Whoa, just, it is written, it is written, it is written. I'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm going to cast out devils. I, I'm going to raise people from the dead. And if you even try to take me up by giving me something harmful, pfft, you lose. Because God's already won. We got to get our minds renewed to who we are because then the church will arise and be who he's called us to be. We're not broken, ridiculous, whiny people hoping that God will show up on any given day to throw us something. He has given you everything pertaining to your life, everything you'll need to walk in victory. And on top of that, on top of that, are you made in the image and likeness of God? Are you sons of the Most High God? Did Jesus say you could be like him? Okay, 1 John 3b, 3a-b. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, you should get a little bit excited about this. Because if Jesus manifested, he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, and you are like him, because as he is in this world, so are we, then we are also created to defeat the devil. <laughs> now we're talking. Now we're talking. If we get this, then our little hands will start doing things differently. And our little mouths will start speaking forth truth with confidence. And our little actions will show forth the glory of God on the earth. And then we'll start looking like Jesus, talking like Jesus, being like Jesus, and doing the works of Jesus, not only to minister to those that are sick and alone, but to defend. Feet openly. The devil. There's nothing that gives me any more pleasure than showing him for the jerk that he is. Because he destroys lives and he hurts hearts and he takes families and he rips them apart and he makes horrible things happen to good people. 
And I, for one, am tired of the church remaining in such a way that we act as though we are powerless when we have been given everything. To be powerful. Amen? Amen? Okay. This is what Jesus prayed for you. Now, I want you to get this. John 17, starting in verse 6. I just love this. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and the women you gave me. They were yours in the first place. See, he knew. Jesus is like, he knew we were always were. He's talking about his disciples right here, but are you his disciple? Okay. So he said, they always were, because see, they were yours in the first place. They were yours in the first place, and then you gave them to me. He goes, these disciples right here, you gave them to me. And they have now done what you said. They know now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them. And they took it, and they were convinced that I came from you. They got it. They believe that you sent me, and so I pray for them. And I'm not praying for the God-rejected world, but for the ones that you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours, and yours mine. And my life, oh, just, if you don't remember anything else right here. Everything mine is yours and yours mine, and my life is on display where? Oh. Jesus' life is on display where? What? You guys should all be going, wow. Jesus' life is on display inside of you. It's in you. Okay, well, maybe not. How many of you are Christians? Okay, if you can raise your hand and you're a Christian, Jesus' life is on display through you. Oh, come on. Oh, it's so good. Thank you, God. Okay. I don't even know where I'm at. Uh, okay. Ooh. Okay. For I'm no longer going to be visible to the world, but they'll continue in the world while I return to you. So here's what Jesus did. He goes, basically this. I lived by the Spirit. I showed you how to do it. I modeled it for you. Here's the ball. You're it. Tag, you're it. You are on display representing him now. You're going to continue in the world because he returned to the Father. Oh, but what did he give you? Oh, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives where? In just the person next to you because they have a title or whatever? No. Because their life was easier? No. Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in every believer. And so, when I return to you, Holy Father, you will guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift. That you conferred as a gift through me. Jesus goes, here's your gift. Boom. Walk like I walk. Talk like I walk. Do what I did. You can do it. I've given you everything. You're going to be equipped. You are one heart and one mind with me, with the Father, and with the Holy Spirit. Just arise and go and do. 
Just be what God has called you to be. Just do what he's called you to do. Just go ahead and destroy the works of the enemy. Just prove to him it's not going to work. Just overcome the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Just go ahead and defeat every temptation because you have the ability to live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. And you don't have to die in this life. You don't have to give up and be some little wimpy, whiny Christian. You can be a victorious, in-your-face Christian displaying who God is throughout the earth because that is who you are made to be. And Jesus won it for you. And he modeled it for you. And it's time for you to model it to other people so that the world will know our God is alive. Our God is alive. And he lives and reigns in me. And in you. It is our God. It is Jesus. He gets all the praise. He gets all the honor. He gets all the glory. But we get to have fun destroying the works of the enemy. Woo! The devil is defeated. Get it in your brain. Get it in your spirit. Get it in your soul. We win. We win. Because he won. He modeled it. And now you're it. We're going to be led by the spirit. And operate in the things that bring freedom to people. And live with action. That proves that the enemy does not have any authority here anymore. The church is arising into a new dimension, and you are the church. It is in you. You are the church. 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 You are the representation of Jesus on the earth. The church is arising into a new awareness, and you're going to do incredible things as soon as you let it go from here to here. Well, I tried that and it didn't work. Well, try again. Everybody I've ever known that raised somebody from the dead didn't raise somebody from the dead before they raised somebody from the dead. Everybody who who had faith to heal somebody started out by not having faith to heal somebody. Everybody who cast out a demon wasn't successful at first. You have to exercise the Spirit of God. And know that you can trust what he says. Fall so in love with him. That you have confidence in what his prayer was. Do you really think God would answer Jesus' prayer? I just read you what he prayed about you. So if anybody's getting their prayers answered today, it's Jesus. Now all you have to do is walk in it. All you have to do is walk in it. Empowered by truth, by the foundation of the written word. And walking according to the spirit. That you're not weak or beggars. But that you are strong because you have relationship that you're operating out of. Not because you're perfect. It's only one perfect one. But because you know him. And you're so convinced that what he told you you could do, you can do. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to bring you joy. It is. You think you can find happiness by living at Disney? It's a nice place to visit. But you can't live there. It's fantasy land. But I'll tell you where you can live. You can live in the presence of Almighty God. And you can be transformed into his image and into his likeness. And you can do exploits on the earth. And then you find happiness. You find joy. You find contentment because you're finally operating as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Representing him on the earth. Oh, that's fun. Oh, that's fun. 
So let's go have some fun. Okay, did you get it? Okay. Oh, yeah, offering. Thank you. Okay. The Bible says, whatever a man sows, thank you, that shall he also reap. Whatever you put inside of your heart, if you deposit the word of God in your heart, it's going to come out. Whatever you deposit when you're offering anything up to God, you know, David, the man after God's own heart, he said, I'm not going to offer up anything to my God that didn't cost me something. Come on. Well, I don't have extra. That's why you don't have extra, you tightwad. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> well, with that, ushers, wait on the people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say, I declare that I'm not going to allow any thought in my life that goes against God or what he's promised. I'm bringing every thought captive until it lines up with the word of God. <laughs> and so I speak forth abundance because he said he wants me to live in it. And so when I sow my seed, I'm expecting my harvest so that I can be a blessing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. Wow. Okay. I don't, this, as you can tell, is a series more of teaching than preaching, although I usually end up with a little bit of a preach because I can't stand it. But you might have to get the tapes or watch it online or listen to it on podcast. I, I swear to you with everything that I am, if you will really get this, if you will get this, it will change you. If you can live according to the Spirit, you're going to win. If you can really live this out, you're going to be better off. Everything in your life is going to shift into God's purpose, design, and structure. And so this is what I want for you. So I'm not promoting, uh, yeah, I'm just promoting the truth. I'm promoting the truth. You need to get it. It's free. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Well, I am trying to sell you on Jesus, but I'm not trying to sell it to you for money. It's free, free gift. Go get it, receive it, and then live it. Amen? Okay, I love you. But who do you love the most? <laughs> and who loves you the most? Yes. And who loves them the most? Now go act like Jesus to them and see how it happens. All right? And happy Father's Day. If you would like to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit our website at www.LibertyLifeCenter.org. Find the link to the left that says, Donate Now, and follow the instructions there. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing worldwide through this ministry.